I want to voice my gratitude to you, my family, who took a risk and came out to experience an evening of 12-step humor. This tape is dedicated to those who never had a chance. Your comedian tonight has performed in 41 states and five different countries. He's in recovery, but the insanity remains. Please welcome Mark L. Thank you. Thanks very much. God bless you. Oh, man, I'll tell you, I, I bet, thank you so much. I uh, spent two months solid working regular comedy clubs, and tonight you have no idea how thrilled I am to look at a whole audience full of designated drivers. <laughs> My name's Mark. I'm an alcoholic and drug addict. Get down with your bad recovering cells. I always say alcoholic and an addict because uh, there's a subtle difference. Uh, an alcoholic, of course, is that person who will drive home drunk smack their car into a tree, sit behind the wheel and go, that's it, i got to quit driving. A drug addict will drive home, same physical condition, hit the same tree, walk away from the accident going, <laughs> Hell, it wasn't my car. <laughs> and of course, a codependent. Codependents out there the next morning cutting that tree down. <laughs> it's all your fault. Ah. <laughs> I knew very early on in life I was codependent. We'd sit and watch the Brady Bunch on TV. I fantasized about being Alice. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there may be another issue there. I don't know. <laughs> Man, you want to work some issues? I had to work on some personal issues. Very intense personal stuff recently. I had to write Greyhound. Uh. Have you been on one of these rolling detox centers? <laughs> Talk about principles in all our affairs. My God. That Greyhound system is just wrong. The driver had three teeth, three, in his pocket. I'm coming down the center aisle of the Greyhound bus and all the seats are packed except one in the back and I'm next to a guy who's just staring at me, he's just staring. This is between Memphis and, and, and Nashville, Tennessee. Ah. Coming down the aisle, and the guy's staring at me the whole way. I get real close to me. He says, is that an earring in your ear? <laughs> Thinking real quick, I said, oh, no, no, sir. That's a, that's a birthmark. <laughs> he said, well, okay, sit down. Thank God all bigots are ignorant. <laughs> I'm sitting on the Greyhound, this close space with drooling drunks and whiners and dope fiends. It was like Thanksgiving at Mom's. <laughs> Alcoholism, drug ad addiction, rampant in my family. Codependency all over the place. Hell, our dog needed Alipet. <laughs> I remember the first time someone told me, Mark, your family's dysfunctional. It was at the arraignment, and uh, <laughs> I learned a lot that day. Uh, it's still hard for me to believe I can stand in bright lights in front of a group of people, and someone from the dark doesn't yell out, Number three, step forward. I could have been a regular on Cops. <laughs> That's my favorite show. Now. 
I love sitting home watching other people go to jail. Ah! Dude, I did that. <laughs> Wasn't on TV, you loser. Ah! I tell you what, I've never, I've never been a normal person. I was born with this disease, and uh, there are certain things that come with the territory. Certain knowledge we all have. There are things we all know that we all know we all know, but we don't all know until we all get here, you know? <laughs> Example. You people that snorted your dope, who made the best straws out there? <laughs> See what we know? Was that on the menu? No. <laughs> Nobody behind the counter ever said, free with your Happy Meal, big fat Coke straw. <laughs> Have a nice day, drug addict. <laughs> No, he's in here five times a day. <laughs> Information we pick up along the way. It just happens. A good alcoholic knows that they never sell beer in California between 2 and 6 a.m. Don't sell it. They don't sell beer. They don't sell any alcohol. But you can go into a 7-Eleven, 24-hour mini mart, something like that, and buy a bottle of... See what we know. 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., I quill happy hour. Hey! That's why they give you a shot glass and everything. <laughs> Which I never used. Oh, we won't be needing you. <laughs> My, was I feverish. Because you have this disease, you never have to step foot into a crack house to know there's certain things you're not going to hear in there. <laughs> you're never going to hear in a crack house, Hey, did you lose a $10 bill? <laughs> you're never going to hear in a crack house, So tell me, buddy, how long have you been with IBM? <laughs> you're surely never going to hear this in a crack house. No, 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 after you. And if you're born with this disease like I was, you don't tell the truth. We're not truthful. No. Rigorous honesty is a nice goal. It's impossible, though, if you're a real person. <laughs> it's a nice ideal. It's a nice thing to shoot for. But everybody lies. Everybody. You're asleep 6.30 in the morning. You're sound asleep. The phone rings. Hello? No, I was awake. And you tell the truth all day. You go to the video store. You rent a video. They got the counter and says, this is due back by 7 tomorrow. God, dude. <laughs> Sometimes these are in my car for a week. <laughs> Can you be truthful at work? Why won't you be into work today? Because I haven't even been to bed yet. Ah! You can't tell the truth all the time, all time. Sometimes you should not tell the truth. You get in an elevator with a stranger. It's just the two of you. A very polite, courteous stranger and yourself. A polite, courteous stranger leans to you and says, How are you today? Me? I, 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 I have gas. <laughs> Thanks for asking, but you better get off. I'm going to pop you out the door in a minute. No, I don't know you. My ass is slammed shut right now. I'm uncomfortable. It's the truth, but should you say it? <laughs> Heaven forbid you should ever experience the pain of being pulled over for drinking and driving. Heaven forbid that should happen to you. But when you do, the first thing out of the cop's mouth at your window is going to be, Have you been drinking, drinking this evening? <laughs> you know it, Daddy O. Ha! Have I been drinking? What was your first clue, Porky? Ha! Honk, honk, honk. Have I been drinking? I'm all over the road. What are you, new? <laughs> Certain things we all share. 
certain information we all have when we get here. Some of us like to think we're unique, though, when we get here. That's why there's all these splinter programs coming around. Uh, there seems to be 12-step programs for every kind of thing. I was in New York City. I, I saw Artists Anonymous. Artists on Powerless Over Paint. Do you need that? I was in Vancouver, Canada the first time I heard EA. Emotions Anonymous. Emo- I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm guilty, I'm angry. I'm... <laughs> you're human. Welcome. Oh, you're crying. Go work a step. How specific do you need to be? You want to take every symptom of this disease and make a program out of it? That's a lot of work. Go to DA, Denial Anonymous. Hi, my name's Mark, and this isn't my fault. In fact, I don't even belong here. Minimizers Anonymous. That'd be a one-step program. (laughs) Paranoids Anonymous. They won't tell you where those meetings are. Procrastinators Anonymous. Today's meeting, postponed. <laughs> you want to be addicted to adrenaline? That's a rush. That endorphin thing that kicks in. You go to adrenaline, uh, adrenaline problem, you got, go to Bungee Jumpers Anonymous. BJA. Lord knows when they hit a bottom. Oh, man. <laughs> I've been to OA. Over here just to give them hope. <laughs> AA and NA and CA and CA. There's cocaine on us. I was, uh, <laughs> went to a CA meeting once. I was the only one in the room without a beeper. <laughs> oh, I'm not judging. I'm just saying. Don't get me wrong. I like my go fast. I like my powdered stamina stuff. I like that hurry up, go, go, go chemical. I like that. I wake up today in fifth gear. God, good day today. <laughs> And then I make coffee. And <laughs> but I would drink to level out and coke to go up and crank to go upper and come down on drinking. And, but it, man, I was up and down. I was yo-yo boy, man. <laughs> I'd sit in a meeting of CA and start jonesing so bad I had to go to AA to take the edge off. There's ACA and GA and uh, AAA and SSSSSA. That's uh, Stutters Anonymous. <laughs> That's a long meeting. <laughs> Hi, my name's Kick 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 Kick. I'm a sis 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 sis. The whole room. Hi, Kick Kick. <laughs> Two hours and nobody shared. (laughs) We have addictions in so many forms as human beings. Food and drugs and alcohol and gambling and and sex. Anybody addicted to sex? Anybody at all? Not to embarrass you, just so we can get to know you better. I don't know how any one of us gets here to some form of recovery without some form of physical sexual dysfunction. Me personally, progressive disease measured right in this area here. Progressive disease? Oh my, yes. When I first started doing drugs, 17, 18 years old, that thing wouldn't go down. Four hours, I'm dunking her pumpkin. Ding, 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 ding. She's been asleep for the last two. But I gotta finish because I'm a man. That's in the law. A few years later, more progressive, 50-50. Oh, please, just work tonight. Please, I really like her. 
<laughs> please. Please, him, please. At the end of my trail, drug-wise, zero. Zero fun. I had a terminal case of sleepy pee-pee. When I got into recovery, the first time I had sex in recovery, fear, head to toe, fear. Ah! No liquid courage. No powdered stamina. Nothing I used to rely on to rely on. So I took suggestions from some people in the program. I was really nervous about this night. I knew it was going to happen ahead of time. Oh, my God. And I, I took some suggestions. A candlelight dinner. Yes. Bubble bath. Candles in the bath. Mood music. Incense. What a moment. Spiritual, emotional, physical. All in one. I remember rolling over in bed afterwards thinking, my God, I can't wait to try this with a partner. <laughs> Somehow I knew you'd understand. That's my common bond with everybody in here. I don't think like anyone else on earth except everyone in here. Because of the way I think, I can sit in a whole stadium full of human beings and feel very isolated and totally alone. I think like that. Because of the way I think, when I was getting towards the end of my act of drinking and doping, I, I would rather die than have to quit. I tried to quit. I thought, at least if I'm dead, I won't be still doing this. That's how I think. That made sense to me. Early on in recovery, something nice would happen to me along the way. I knew I didn't deserve that. I'd look over my shoulder. When's the bad stuff coming? That's the way I think. Because the way I think, I can walk in here tonight and act like I'm better than you are. Because inside, I'm afraid I'm not half as good. Because of the way I think, when I was out there running and gunning and chasing and doping it, I could withstand years of physical abuse. Years. The day I got into recovery, you could crush me with a word. This disease today is no longer about a substance for me. It's about substance. It's about substance. I've been sober a few years and at any minute, I can think like a newcomer. I have that ability because of the way I think. <laughs> it's only in a room like this, in front of people like you, that I feel totally comfortable saying out loud, every day I hear voices in my head. <laughs> I know there's people in here going, oh yeah, how many? On a good day, there are only three. There are never less than three. Welcome to the inside of my head. There's voice number one, the recovery voice, the one that is supportive and helpful, and I learn from you. Stand straight and tall and wants me to do little good things today. Pet, 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 one step at a time. There's voice number two, the hunchback, diseased, destructive, cancerous, troll-like little guy. wants me to fail at everything I do today. And then there's voice number three, the third voice, the observer, the one that watches the other two battle it out. And no matter what the topic, the third one says, fuck it. I still have the ability to be selfish and cruel and self-centered up here. I still have that ability. That, that thinker is still there. I, a couple days ago, I'm at a noon meeting. 12 to 1. It's an hour long. Nooner meeting, hour long. 105, some guy's still talking. <laughs> five minutes. I can't spare five minutes for you. I got a life. 
Settle down, settle down. He might need to talk. Need to talk? You had a whole hour! <laughs> the guy's saying good stuff, too. He's saying stuff like, he's saying, you know, God gives me what I need every day. Ask him for a watch, loser! Because of the way I think and the disease I have between my ears, it makes perfect sense to me that if I'm late somewhere and I'm on the highway, I have the right to drive like an asshole. Get out of my way. Get out of my way. Get out of my way. I'm late. And I know it's my fault I planned poorly, but now it's on you. Move over. You, you, yeah, yeah, you move over. Move over. It's a four-lane highway. Fast lane here means go fast. Not like you. Move over. Move over. Move over. There's three other lanes. Slow, slower, and remedial for you. Move over. Move over. Move, move, move. Move. I'll go around then. Oh, now you move over. Move over. Move. I'm, I'm late for church, you fucker. I find that I'm at my best when I think like a child. Like a child. Open-minded, honest. Children, truthful. <clears throat> Are they not children? Truthful? Very truthful. They can't help it. Everything that comes in here has to come out there. Little kids have no filter between brain and mouth. If a four-year-old tells you you got a big nose, <laughs> sorry. You'll be looking in the mirror. Hey, I got a big nose. <laughs> Hoop, there it is. Kids can't help it. They just can't help the way they are. Kids learn. That's their job. Learn, learn, learn. Learn, learn, learn. <laughs> learn, learn, learn. I'm little. I'm learning. My body doesn't work right yet, but I'm learning. Learn, 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 learn. <laughs> Children are computers. Babies are laptops. How many parents here by applause? <clears throat> God bless you for coming out to play. That's a kid's whole life, isn't it? We. Little kids are happy. Learn, learn, learn. We. They're happy about little things we forgot about a long time ago. Ooh, look, a full moon. <laughs> we. I'm wearing my brand new pair of socks on the carpet. Shock. <laughs> we. We put peanut butter on the cat's balls. <laughs> we. <laughs> I don't care how old you are. There's wees out there. Kids are just more open minded, they have more options. There's adult wees. Uh, parking space right in front. We. Shaving with a brand new razor. We. You got that certain phone call. We. You didn't get that certain phone call. We. We put peanut butter on the cat's balls. We. I'm learning we from your children, from my child. I have a six year old daughter. Her name's Courtney. I love her more than anything on earth, that little kid. She's a. Uh, she doesn't live with me. She lives with her mommy or the plaintiff. <laughs> learn, learn, learn. <laughs> They'll frighten you, kids will, because they change. Kids change. Three years ago, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I call Courtney like I do every day. I call her every day. It's a highlight of my whole day hearing her voice. Three years ago in Atlanta, I called for the first time ever. She answered the phone right away. First voice I hear is my daughter's. I'm scared to death. I'm thinking, where the hell's the plaintiff? I said, Courtney, why'd you answer the phone? She said, Daddy, it rang. Duh. I knew she was thinking, no wonder Mommy doesn't live with you anymore. Time will heal many, many things I thought were impossible. My ex-wife and I, Sharon, she has a name. Beautiful woman. She does. 
She's a beautiful woman. She's a good mommy. I love her. She's a very good friend. That has happened in time. She's remarried to a very nice man, too. Courtney has two daddies, Daddy Mike and Daddy Mark, which is okay with me because some kids never get one, ever. Courtney has two daddies that love her a lot. About a year and a half ago, my ex-wife and her new husband, Daddy Mike, had a baby boy. Justin is his name. The day Justin was born, I called Courtney. How's your little brother? Daddy, he's brand new. (laughs) I said, good, you take care of him. Okay, Daddy. I said, listen, honey, go ask Mommy if Justin... Looks like me. (laughs) Hey, I'm only human. (laughs) Courtney comes running back to the telephone. She goes, Daddy, Mommy said a bad word. (laughs) Wee, Daddy. Creative, determined, resourceful, childlike. I know older people that are like that. My grandfather's 93 years old. He says a sense of humor is the most valuable tool he has. Sense of humor. He would know, 93. They asked him in the rest home where he lived. They said, they said what's the secret to living a long time? He said, hey, don't die. Ha! Ha ha ha! Oh, ow. I got to a treatment center in 1988, and it was one of these. You familiar with these places, treatment center? Where you, where you pay like $15,000 to find out that meetings are free. Hey. <laughs> That's why they call it dope. <laughs> I asked the doctor there. He, he, I said, am I here for a reason? He said, yeah, you're here for a reason. Do you know what it is? I said, I'm pretty sure I don't think right. I'm crazy. He said, no, 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 my friend, you're a drug addict. You think you can fix any kind of life's problems with chemical? I said, okay. can you give me something for that? I didn't get it through my head that no matter what the chemical substance was, it equaled pain for me. Chemical equals pain. Very simple formula, except if you think like I do. (laughs) Chemical equals pain. Pot equals pain. Alcohol equals pain. Vodka equals pain. Better pot equals pain. Coke equals pain. Methamphetamine equals pain. Fill in the blank equals pain. When I was a young boy, I zipped up my hoo-hoo and my zipper. (laughs) I only had to do that one time. My brain never said, let's try that again, expecting different results. A lot of things I've found that certain events or or memories that have healed in time, that's the biggest gift I have these days is time, information to use with that time. I got, to a, I got to the treatment center in, uh, in 88, in October of 88, uh, in four-point restraint. I was, a, I was a street person. I was a homeless guy. I, was a, I lived on Broadway in Oakland in a cardboard box in uh, October of 88. And, uh, I, I say cardboard box like it was always the same one. <laughs> I had an address, my mail, little flowers, throw pillows. <laughs> They get wet, you get a new one. I live like that by choice. Some of us in this family of ours is huge. You know, homeless through circumstances beyond our control. Me, I chose that lifestyle. I chose to live on that street instead of getting help or gainful employment or shelter. I chose that. Progressive disease, my God. October 19th, 1988, I was laying in a motel room in Hayward, California, with a loaded gun pressed to the roof of my mouth. Because I just didn't want to be here anymore. I was so tired of living like we have to sometimes. I was pretty sure if I was dead, I wouldn't continue to live like that.
The barrel of a gun is very hard, and your roof of your mouth is quite a soft area. I was sure it was going to work, and I would be cured. I'd never have to run or hide or chase, be chased ever again. I was looking for some belief. My God, that sounds so good. But I had a picture of Courtney at the time. She was a... She was five months old and uh, had a picture of her, five by seven on my chest. I hadn't seen her for about four months. And a picture of her on my chest and a gun on my mouth. And I just remember thinking, I can't do that to her. Even the little diseased voice said, ah, we might want to rethink this one. <laughs> learn, learn, learn. She sits now. So am I. She's. The day after the gun in the mouth thing, I checked into Gladman Hospital in Oakland by choice. And they asked me, Are you suicidal? I said, Yes, every day for a long time. They put me in four-point restraint. I thought I made a bad decision at the time. <laughs> I, I, I was laying there in four-point restraint and thinking, this is not right. This is, uh, man, I'll tell you, four-point restraint. If, if you're not familiar with the four-point restraint, it's ankles and wrists strapped to a platform. You can't get up from them. They're not little watch straps. Oh, no, 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 no. Big, fat, wide, double, prong, strap, strap, strap. And I'm looking over in detox next to me at this guy in five-pointer string. He's got one right here on, around his neck. I'm thinking, hey, I'm not that bad. I can move my head. Ha, ha. Look at me, buddy. I am a winner. I started doing comedy in 89 in treatment centers. Never did it before I got clean and sober. I was a coke dealer, check forger, tax evader. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Looks damn good on a resume. <laughs> what were you into? Uh, sales. <laughs> 89, I volunteered to do comedy in treatment centers and rehabs and Salvation Armies and jails and prisons. Teach how to handle an audience. You guys, you're a gift. Here, Giff, you chose to be here tonight, most of you. I know some of you got sponsors. <laughs> You're going, damn it. You're going to have fun. Come on. I did the penal circuit for two years. The jails and the rehabs and things like that. For two years, 89 and 90, that's all I did. Five, six nights a week. I would drive three hours to do 15 minutes, drive three hours home. <laughs> True story, 1989, San Quentin Federal Penitentiary. I'm doing a show, not living there. <laughs> doing a show for 20 lifers. They're never getting out. Never coming out of that premises alive. Never coming. Oh, what a happy bunch of fellas. I got a cyclone fence between me and them. Thank God. Uh, eight foot cyclone fence between me and the, G the general population. And, and it's biggest, baddest guy in Quentin. And, and biggest, oh man, huge guy. Biggest guy in Q is sitting in the front row. Big old tank top on. He's got muscles all over his body. He's just huge, muscle bound guy. Ripped and cut and buffed and muscle. He's got muscles in his eyes. And he's just staring at me. He's got a bald head, tattoos all over the man, intimidating me. And I said, oh, look at you, uh, smooth head, all that ink. You could be a ballpoint pen. Ha. <laughs> oh. He didn't laugh. He stood up. He put his big sausage fingers through the cyclone fence. Big old ham hock hands are in there. A funny man. I got friends on the outside. They'll find you. Tie you to a tree in your yard. Burn your house to the ground. 
People, that is a heckler, okay? <laughs> Some drunk in a comedy club? Oh, we! I still go back and do the facilities, the, the rehabs and the prisons and the gyms. And I never want to forget what it's like to be there and leave. <laughs> Big old we there. I tell them, though, when I pull up in front of the, the rehab thing or the hospital detox situation, I, I tell them, you know, people want to, when I pull up in front of here today, I, I do two things. Because I, I love you, I say a prayer. Because I know you, and I lock my car. <laughs> I've met a lot of people on this planet, but my favorite one is this guy. My favorite guy that I've ever met on the road. Birmingham, Alabama. I'm, uh, I'm wearing this convention jacket that I got for work at a 12-step convention. On the back of the jacket, uh, hope in recovery is what it says. Hope in recovery. Silver jacket with big pink letters on the back. In Alabama, that's just wrong. I'm getting ready to go in the club and wearing this jacket. A guy stops me on the street. He goes, hi, hi. They used to do dope. I said, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> he said, then you quit. I said, yeah, I quit. He goes, damn. I quit dope. I didn't get no jacket. We. I'm thinking to myself, maybe it's possible to quit just a day too late. I still don't think like normal people. It happens to me all the time. I just got this, uh, I just got home off the road and I get this piece of mail at my home. And uh, I live in San Jose, California now, and I get this piece of mail. It's about an auction. The county I live in, Santa Clara County, is auctioning off things that have been seized by the county sheriff's department in the past. <laughs> Appliances and furniture and, and stereos and, da, 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 and cars and jewelry. Most people, normal thinking people, think, see that piece of mail and think, I can get a good deal. I'm thinking, maybe I get my stuff back. <laughs> I used to get in trouble for repeating things I heard at home. In school, first grade, we're learning about the alphabet. The letter H is on the board, and I'm not paying attention. I was kind of a wild kid. My teacher said, Mark, you're not paying attention as usual. Mister, why don't you tell this class everything you know about the letter H? I said, oh, that's, that's Jesus' middle initial. <laughs> I remember one time getting in trouble. I, was, I, was, I owed, a, I owed a, a dope dealer some money, and he found me and took me, escorted me to his home. Very intense situation, very frightening man. He was one of these guys that had, had a throat thing and had to talk. One that thing right here. <laughs> he was very intimidating. He had two big old buff bodyguards there, and I'm a little 22 year old little pipsqueak, scared little skinny guy. He's saying things to me. You're a little bub. You are a little bub. You, know, I can buy a Mercedes with the money in my pocket. I can get any woman I want. I could crush you like a bug. <laughs> you, what can you do? I said, me, I, I can whisper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Oregon recently. I'm at a meeting, a 12-step meeting, and I go to a lot of meetings on the, on the road. And I, once in a while, I like to play. <laughs> I'm at a meeting, 12 step meeting in Oregon recently, and they, they're talking. They say, How about the guy from California? Would you like to talk? Said, sure, I'm, I'm a little lonesome being away from home, especially today, because in California today's Amnesty Day. <laughs> One day a year in California we can drink or use anything we want. It doesn't count against our clean time. <laughs> Serenity gone! In the room, everybody, oh, big issues, new topic in the meeting. Arr, 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 that's not right. Oh, those California people, arr, 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 arr. I'm going, <laughs> except for the new people in the room, they're going, dude, we're moving. <laughs> I don't think like normal people, and I've met someone who doesn't mind putting up with that. And you know about that. And my common bond with you is that I don't think 
like anyone else on earth except every single person in this family. And I know that because normal people, they invent stuff I wouldn't ever need. Normal people, God bless them. They, they invented the coated aspirin pill. <laughs> Who the heck is that for? I'm a drug addict. If it'll get me loaded, I'll swallow a cue ball and a handful of sand. Normal people invented the car alarm. The car alarm. Remember when you used to have to break into an automobile to take it? No longer. You, know, you just, late at night, kick the bumper, wait for the owner with the keys. <laughs> Thank you. Go back to bed, Normie. <laughs> this is mine now. Good night. Normal people invented the Gladlock baggie system. Blue and yellow make... Green. Did we need that? <laughs> no. My friends, you and I, we could close a Ziploc baggie in the dark with one finger during a seizure. <laughs> Zip! It's a gift! I don't care what color your ancestors were. Who you choose as your significant other. I don't care about your bank account. Or your taste of music. If you drive a Mercedes or take the bus. I don't care if you're 93 or 7 months old. You deserve everything good that life has to produce for you. You're worthy of love and respect and fun now. It's time. If you breathe air, we're related to each other. I don't care what you're addicted to, person, alcohol, substance, food, lifestyle. I don't care. I don't care if you're addicted to collecting pencils. <laughs> Go to PA. <laughs> you will find in time and working steps, there will always be pencils in the world. But you don't have to pick one up. <laughs> I get to this point in the show and I'm always... Astounded and grounded by what we used to be capable of, you and I, and who we were, what happened if you put us in the same space for very long, and none of that happened tonight. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Something phenomenally wonderful happens when you and I get together under the same roof for that long. It's a huge, powerful process we're involved here, and I am a small, little, teeny, tiny part, and I get very humble at this point because it's huge what happens to us. Huge. And it keeps happening. Good night. Thank you. In 1996, I recorded the following material. It's called More is Better. Go figure. And it was done in the Midwest, the United States. It's kind of the next level, uh, the progression of humor from Mark. Enjoy. He's performed in 43 of the 50 states and in over five different countries. Uh, get ready to hold on to your seats. Come on right now. Let's go. Okay. I'll tell you what, thanks for coming out tonight, spending your hard-earned money and free time here. I know you could have been anywhere you want in town. That is a compliment that's never lost on me, ever. I'm thrilled to see it, and I'll tell you why. I started doing comedy at jails, drug rehabs, halfway houses, and other places I've lived. Yeah. <laughs> 
I love working for people who choose to be an audience. That's the most comfortable part of my whole day. For 41 minutes, I'll tell the truth tonight. I can do that from here. Most comfortable part of my whole day. As long as I'm not mean or arrogant, we're cool. Up here, I'm fearless, confident, comfortable, feel kind of nice. <laughs> Out there, I'm a dork. <laughs> I I'm from California, and I was here in January. What's that tell you? <laughs> oh, wrong. <laughs> Cold. <laughs> oh, man, and here's what I did. Here's how lame I am. I locked my keys in my car with it running. <laughs> and I knew it right away. Oh! <laughs> okay, my God. <laughs> there they are. And they're telling me, here we are. It's warm in here. <laughs> Hour and 40 minutes, I'll wait for AAA. <laughs> and the guy got there, he told me only the driver's door was locked. <laughs> That's who you're looking at. I'm, I'm kind of a hyper guy, you know. And I am. As a kid, I was Riddlin' Boy. <laughs> So I try to burn off some of that energy during the day by, by running. I run for an hour a day. I don't want to come up on stage and have too much built up and blow a spleen on you, you know? <laughs> so I go to the gym. Two groups of people in the gym that intimidate me. Men and women. <laughs> <laughs> and they use the same equipment in there. I get off this piece of machinery in the health club, and uh, this nice young lady's been waiting. So I'll be playing, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll move the pin up for her, I think. I, Where do you want that? She said, add 100. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> she said, can you spot me? I go, she no. <laughs> You know, if you drop that, we both die. <laughs> As a man in the gym, there's a general rule of thumb. You're supposed to be able to bench press at least your own weight. I'm almost there. All i got to do is lose like 60 more pounds. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so I get on this treadmill to do my hour run, and I, you, you got to punch in information on that thing. You can't just push a button and run. No, that would be far too easy. <laughs> Got to punch in information. Miles per hour, the elevation of the machine, the calories you want to burn, your mother's maiden name. <laughs> I got to go too fast. Uh oh, there it goes. Uh oh, God help me. I can't run for 60 minutes at 12.5 miles an hour. Not me. Nope. Not in that kind of shape. Nope. Slow down. Decrease. 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 Slow down. But keep your feet moving. Because if you stop your feet, you're gone. <laughs> All of a sudden, you're on the other side of the gym on the stairmaster. <laughs> Someone's back. Help me, please. Oh, 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 I'm as surprised as you are, really. But let's keep running. You're in good shape. What is that, a Wonder Bra you got on there? That's... So, I look... so I look next to me. There's a guy next to me on a treadmill just like the one I'm on. He's in his 70s. He's a stud. He's just cooking along there, just running. No problem. I'm staring at him. I'm thinking, you go, you... Crusty old turd. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> <he's>, <laughs> he sees me struggling next to him. He says, best results, young man, if you inhale through your nose and exhale out your mouth. <laughs> proper cardiovascular breathing technique, inhale nose and exhale mouth. That's a proper way. And I'm watching him. He's going... <laughs> I have to suck air through every hole I own. You gotta breathe, man. Breathe. Trust me, buddy. You gotta...
Look at that. I had a lady in Pittsburgh puke during my show. She went very much. It's a good night for a comedian, really. How was the show? She threw up. You're coming back, man. Functional my home, information, information, things I'm comfortable with now. Life's not fair, but I can try to be. I know that now. Men are capable of other emotions besides anger and lust. I know that now. Women are equals, not objects. I know that now. <laughs> I've heard that stuff in my home. You know what I heard from my mom? Move back! You'll ruin your eyes! <laughs> I used to sit this close to the TV. <laughs> My hand never left that dial. <laughs> or the pliers. <laughs> that was our remote control. Clack, 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 clack. Mark, what are you watching? Everything. I'm watching all 12 channels and oof, whatever that is. <laughs> Mom spoiled that for me Saturday morning. Move back! You'll ruin your eyes! Move back! You'll ruin your eyes! I just go, Mom. Is that you, Mom? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was a wise ass kid, go figure. I didn't know that you could play anytime you want as a child either. I love kids. I have a daughter. She's eight years old. Uh, love her more than anything on this planet, that little girl. I've already started saving for her rehab. <laughs> her name's Courtney. She lives with her mommy, uh, the plaintiff. Uh, actually, we're good friends now. Sharon, she has two names. <laughs> I never heard it's okay to laugh no matter what, uh, as long as I'm not hurting someone else. I never heard that kind of stuff at home. Parents uh, pass on the best they can. I'm trying to pass on things to my daughter that I didn't know, things I've learned from people like you. My mom and dad said things to me that fried my five-year-old mind. I was a hyper kid anyway, you know, go figure. Right. As a kid, I was riddling boy. <laughs> But you've got to be careful what you say to a kid. If you don't want a kid to repeat something you said, don't ever say it. <laughs> They're little recorders. Voice activated. When you speak, they're on. And you don't know when they're going to hit playback. First grade, I'm in parochial school. You familiar with that word? Yeah. Parochial, it's Latin. Parochial, it means no fun at all. <laughs> They would tell me things like, Mark, see that man right there? Mark, see, Mark, Mark! See that man right there? That's a Catholic priest. You call him father, but he can't have sex. <laughs> now the name nuns, I understood. <laughs> I'm in first grade. We learn about the alphabet. That's what you do in first grade, the alphabet. Letter H is on the board. Letter H is right there on the board. My teacher said, Mark, you don't seem to be paying attention as usual. Mister, why don't you tell this class everything you know about the letter H? Mm. I said, well, that's Jesus' middle and this. say, I thought not. What is that, a poem? <laughs> Did you clean your room, mister? I thought not. You take out the trash, I thought not. The message I'm getting, mom doesn't think a whole bunch. <laughs> I was very literal as a kid. What you said to me better be what you meant, because I didn't hear what you meant. I heard what you said. <laughs> learn, learn, learn. <laughs> My mom would say, I've told you a million times, don't exaggerate. <laughs> My mom's sniffing glue. 
she'd say, do you want a spanking? No. <laughs> no, I don't think so, but thanks for asking this time. <laughs> Just say no. <laughs> Hell no! Uh -oh. That got me one. Pow! In our house, the word sock was a verb. <laughs> But not from mom. No mom and dad had separate jobs. Mom was the speaker of the house. <laughs> dad was our designated hitter. <laughs> mom yelled, Dad spank. There was a whole punishment car wash for the kids. <laughs> kids know mom's a boss. Dad doesn't learn that till he goes to court. <laughs> Thanks, that didn't used to be funny to me either. <laughs> Any guy who thinks he makes the rules at home lives alone. <laughs> or he will, very soon. I was so amazed at how different creatures can be on this planet. Kids are never prejudiced, they're never judgmental, they're never resentful until they're taught how to be so. I never was. I, I, I liked everybody. And I thought everybody liked me, and that's where I was wrong. But, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, uh, differences between people... I never heard the sexual differences at home. No, 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 no. I was curious. There are rumors as a kid. <gasps> remember seeing the opposite sex naked for the very first time? Do you remember that? Oh. <laughs> oh, that was a good day. <laughs> I was looking at National Geographic magazine. <laughs> so those are boobs. Oh, I like them. Look at this is like the book of boobs, isn't it? <laughs> A lot of boobs in this book. <laughs> Do they come in white? <laughs> I don't care, God. You make them, I'll take them. I was cool. I was seven years old. I was so curious about the anatomy. I stole at seven years old. Stole. A playboy. <laughs> There's a boom. <laughs> There's a butt. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> what is that? A hamster? <laughs> It's smiling. <laughs> my, mom, my, my mom caught me in the parking lot with the stolen Playboy. Don't you ever take something out of a store without paying for it first. What do you got to say for yourself? <laughs> mom, can I have some money? <laughs> Boy, did I miss the point of that lesson. I just want to know what a kid always wants to know. <laughs> They always want to know why. Why something? Why something else? Why? When I was eight years old, I discovered why. Physical difference was there, partially, anyway. Walked in on my parents having sex uh, in their room accidentally. And, uh, well, not accidentally having sex. I mean, accidentally I walked in and <laughs> learn, learn, learn. I walk in and... and, and you know. It's funny now, but I was in group therapy for a while. <laughs> They upped my Ritalin dosage that week. <laughs> I walk in, Dad is standing up. Ooh. Sometimes I still see him. <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner, I'll say, Dad, step away from that turkey. <laughs> oh. 
I walk in, Dad is standing up. Mom wasn't. No, Mom was sitting on the edge of the bed trying to read Dad's belt buckle or something. Whatever they were doing together, it wasn't in the book of hamsters I was holding. All I could tell my mom was, Move back! You'll ruin your eyes! From that day on, I could sit as close to TV as I wanted. Yeah. You want something, Mommy? I thought not. Take all the time you want with that one. Certain things. I, I, uh, I don't think like normal people. I don't hear like normal people. I don't... It has nothing to do with the substance these days. It has substance. I'm a substance abuser all day. Don't think right. Other people in the world who feel like I do, that's a good thing too. The mentality of more is always better. Family. An attitude of me first and you never. Other people who think that next time, next time the same destructive behavior will produce a positive outcome. <laughs> Our whole philosophy of living out there is basically, hey, we'll burn that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> Normal people don't think like we do. Normal people don't do some of the things we did. Normal people don't pull off the highway to an exit they don't need because they thought they almost maybe might have could have seen a cop back there. <laughs> You never know. Normal people. <laughs> normal people don't wear sunglasses in the middle of the night. Normal people don't gaze at a portrait of the Mona Lisa. Look at her smile and think, oh, Xanax. <laughs> normal people don't have sex with someone they've known for eight minutes. We'll take 15 aspirin for a headache. We won't wear one condom. <laughs> and I like that. We're a little slippery. We are. We are. We're the, we're the, we're the, you ever been to a 12-step convention by applause? Ever been? <laughs> Three days of family. Three days of spirituality. Three days of honesty and, and compassion. And, and But we'll leave there Sunday afternoon with a brand new set of hotel towels. <laughs> <laughs> Just the way. <laughs> we're the kind of people that get a whole bunch of tattoos and then tell someone we're afraid of commitment. <laughs> people like us with the mentality, the rationale that we have upstairs here, the more is better, the me first. The immediate gratification is not soon enough. <laughs> We invented different stuff. We invented espresso. Ah, oh, yeah! Full pot of effect in a little cup. Yes, give me that, give me that, give me that. I like it. Yeah, yeah, hurry up with that latte. Let's go, let's go. Come on, I ordered a triple. Yeah, anything less than that, I have to take a nap. Come on, let's go. Come on, come on. I'm trying to get to traffic school. Come on, hurry up. No, no whipped cream. Put in that syringe. What do you do? Know? Man, they hate me at Starbucks. People like us, we invented, we invented daylight savings. Leave it to one of us to manipulate the sun. I, I just need one more hour, man. We invented the electric toothbrush. That was us. There's too much work to do there. We invented the leaf blower. That's how we think. How can I look busy, make a bunch of noise, and move the problem just over there? Well, it looks much better in his yard, doesn't it? We invented the game show Jeopardy. That was us. Who else starts out with all the answers and no questions? Of course, you never see us on this show. We made it too hard for ourselves. We overcomplicate things that are very simple. That's us. 
You'll never see me on that show. Keep the clicker, Alex. I won't be needing this son of a bitch. I wouldn't get the answers right if I saw the same show three days in a row. My light's never going on. Alex, ask Wonder Woman or Brain Boy here. Me in the middle. Tell you how lame I am. My name's Mark, but in the square, I wrote Dick. You know why, Alex? No categories for me. Nothing. 15th century literature. I'm not going there. How about some things I'm familiar with? How about delinquent rent? How about jobs that suck? How about prescription drugs, Alex? Felonies and misdemeanors. Slang names for the human anatomy. I'd like to see huge hooters for a hundred. <laughs> That's my life going on, Alex.